You know, in 1987, Gloria Estefan in the Miami Sound Machine, you remember them? Come on, you, you come on, you, you, come on, baby, won't you do that conga? No, you can't control yourself any longer. You know them, right? All right, I guess some, you know, them. Well, in 1987, they released a hit song entitled Words Get in the Way, and some of you might remember it, but the song is actually about a breakup, uh, and the woman singing the song is upset because uh, the guy is already seeing someone new. And so she's singing these songs, and here are the words she sings. There's something I've been trying to say to you, but the words get in the way. There's so much I want to say, but it's locked deep inside, and if you look in my eyes, we might fall in love again. I won't even start to cry. And before we say goodbye, I tried to say I love you, but the words got in the way. You know, there, there are sometimes words we want to say. We know we want to say them, but we don't. As the song says, that they get locked up inside us. We try, but they're difficult words. So even though we know we should say them, we don't. And as followers of Jesus, uh, there are times we know we should be saying these certain words because these certain words reflect our heart toward certain things or our attitudes. And we know we should be able to say them easily, but we can't. We don't. They're difficult words. Because of our stubbornness or our pride or our inability to really take a look at what, what's going on in people's lives around us, they just kind of get locked up inside of us. We might try to say them, but the words get in the way. You know, the words, I love you, are some such words, right? Sometimes those are difficult words to say, but there are many words that we, we have a difficult time saying. And so over these coming weeks, I want to look at just some of these words we have difficult time saying these difficult words in our lives. And, and the first word I want to talk about this week is after you. After you. Those are difficult words, right? Uh, I mean, because after you. Translation, I'm not first. You are. You know, there are a couple phrases you never need to teach your kids. And most of you, does everyone here have kids? Uh, yeah, so other, other than the actual kids. So uh, a couple of phrases you never need to t tell your kids. That's mine and me first, right? You don't have to teach them. It's natural for them to say those things. You know what's not natural for them to say? After you or you first. You know, those things have to be taught. And this is evidence. Anytime you go into any first or second grade in our schools, and I kind of talked about this a little bit in our children's sermon, you go there and you see the kids. And I remember being one of these kids, right? They're running around. They're, they're uh, rushing, sometimes shoving, cutting in, just so they can be the first in line. Be the first in line for lunch. Be the first in line for, for music class, yeah. Be the first in line for recess. And as an adult, we kind of have perspective on that. And we realize, well, you're going to get there just about the same amount of time anyway. So we kind of give kids this look like, what's with you, kid? What does it really matter? What's in it for you anyway, kid? But as adults, we, we think like that. We reveal that as adults, we kind of have that same mindset at work in us, that what's in it for you, kid? We, we reveal that's really what it's all about. That so much of what we do is motivated, motivated by this thought of what's in it for me? What's in it for me? That's why the words after you, they're difficult words, because we're not putting the other person first. We're not thinking what's in it for the other person. We just want to know what's in it for me. That's natural for us. I mean, that's a natural thing. It's our go-to attitude that, that serve me first. We kind of adapt, uh, adopt in everyday life the, uh, the attitude we're, we're told to, to have if we're on a, a plane that's, that's crashing or there's a crisis, right? You, know, you fly, and many of you know this, at the beginning they go through all the safety things and they give you that talk and they tell you, hey, if we get into something and the air masks drop down, you know what they tell you. They say, adults, get yours put on first. Serve yourself first. First. That way you're able to actually help the kids and other people who might need help. But serve yourself first. Me first. And we take that and, and we kind of adopt that, that attitude about so many things in life. But that me first attitude, it's not supposed to characterize the life of a follower of Jesus Christ. Jesus' desire is that we allow his Holy Spirit to come into our lives and to transform us. Transform that me first into after you. And this is a huge working of the Holy Spirit in our life, if we let him work. You know, making that natural after you attitude our 
our first response. It's what the Holy Spirit does in us. And it's kind of one of the things the Apostle Paul is getting at in the passage I read to you today from Romans chapter 14 and 15. This idea that we are supposed to be developing this attitude, which then will allow us to easily say, after you. Uh, Jim, go ahead and put us up just a couple verses that I already read to you, but, but here they are uh, from, from Romans chapter 14, again, starting at verse 20. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All food is clean, but it is wrong for a person to eat anything that causes someone else to stumble. It is better not to eat meat or drink wine or to do anything else that will cause your brother or sister to fall. Now, you might be thinking, you know, reading this, you're thinking, well, we've made a big jump here. Because we were talking about uh, saying you first, and now we're talking about drinking wine and eating meat. And some of you are thinking, that's really what I want to be doing and talking about, right? And let's talk about the drinking wine and eating meat. But like, how they fit together. Let, let me explain a little bit. You know, let me give you some context about what Paul's writing, and, and you'll see how they kind of fit together here. Paul is writing to people in Rome in the first century. And, and we know so, because we know from history, that most of the people in first century Rome weren't Christians. They weren't followers of Jesus. So, so Paul, although he's writing to followers of Jesus, most of the people around them are not followers of Jesus. Most of the people are still uh, worshiping pagan gods and sacrificing to idols, mute statues, as their gods. And when they would go to worship these gods, these false gods, these idols, in a pagan temple, they would go and they would go to make an animal sacrifice to, to the god. Uh, and so they would take it and, and they would sacrifice this animal. Now afterward... One of several things could happen with the, the animal, the, the meat from that animal that they were taking to sacrifice in the pagan temple. One, it was left there and the priests either used it to eat or, or uh, they took it to the market and they sold it on the market to people who wanted to buy meat. Same way we go to the grocery store and we buy some meat, right? Uh, that's the first thing they have. The second thing, the person who made the sacrifice might, might take it with them and then they sell it at market you know, because they don't need it but they want some money back from it. The third thing that might happen would, would be that the people who made the sacrifice, they would take it with them and they'd take it home and they'd prepare it at home and they'd eat it at home. Either way, most of the time, a lot of these, uh, this meat that was first sacrificed to these false gods, it was finding its way on the dining room tables of the common people. Now, one of the core aspects of the gospel of grace that Paul had been going all over the known world at the time teaching was, was this idea of freedom in Christ. And we've talked about it here. We are free in Christ. We are set free from having to, to obey and follow the Old Testament laws and the restrictions that come with them. So uh, by faith in Jesus Christ, we are set free from having to follow the Old Testament restrictions of what we eat and what we can't eat. The Old Testament kind of told the people, this is clean food, you, you can eat this, but this is unclean, don't you dare go near this. We're set free from that by, by grace in Jesus Christ. But even so, there are still some followers of Jesus in Rome who knew about this meat being sacrificed to the idols, and well, it just doesn't seem right to them to eat it. You know, per perhaps they thought, well, I I'm betraying Jesus. They felt like maybe they were secondhand participating in, in these sacrifices to these false gods. And they thought, that dishonors my God. So they, they didn't want to eat. It just seemed wrong. And so Paul, in writing in Romans here and in other places, his teaching that is, if it seems wrong to you, then it's wrong to you. That's your, you know, your conscience is battling within you. Uh, follow your conscience. Uh, don't eat that meat. You know, Paul's saying that might be the Holy Spirit convicting you of this personally for you. Don't disobey the Holy Spirit of God in you. That, you see, that's the sin when we disobey God. And that kind of brings us to, to where Paul is here in these verses then. In Christ, you are free to eat anything. He says right here, all food is clean. But then there's verse 20. Duh. It is wrong for a person to eat anything that causes anyone else to stumble. Meaning, if you're with one of these people who thinks it's wrong, it's sinful to eat this food sacrificed to idols, don't you dare eat it in front of them. Don't you dare invite them to eat with you. Don't you uh, ask them, hey, do you want some of this? Because Paul says, that's you tempting them to join you. It's wrong for them. Their conscience is against it. And so you are enticing them to sin. 
You're bringing your brother and sister down. Don't do it. You know what Paul's advocating for here? He's advocating for us to have a you first attitude. Because sure, eating this meat might might be a good thing for me. It's tasty. Maybe it's on sale. Maybe it fills my belly better than anything else in the fridge or whatever substituted for a fridge back in first century Rome. It's my favorite food in the world to eat. You see, there's a lot in it for me. That's why the words after you are difficult words. You have to give up what you like, what what you want, for the sake of your brother or sister. After you, it's actually uh, words that say, I serve you or I sacrifice for you. And none of those are easy words. Those are all difficult words. You know, it, it all kind of reminds me of a situation that I recall my junior year in college. I was in my Bible 300 class. And we were talking, and it was October, so it was, it was a timely conversation, you know, because it's October now. And we were talking about how evil manifests itself in the world. And as the conversation went on, it turned to the celebration of Halloween. And I, I, I realized that there were quite a number, by far not a majority, but quite a number of people on campus who did not celebrate Halloween. They were convicted of the evil things that sometimes take place on that night. So they saw the whole holiday, or the whole observance, as evil. They wanted nothing to do with it. They thought it was wrong. And this, by far, was not an attitude that, that was unknown on campus. Because even my Bible professor, he was the one who took that stance. Just like, I want nothing to do with it. It's wrong. But still, every year, the official student activities organization on campus held an event in October where all the traditional Halloween things were going on and being celebrated and being held. It, was, it, was, it wasn't called a Halloween party, but it was kind of like a big campus-wide Halloween party. Now, I've always been part of a family that, that just always loved going out and, and trick-or-treating and, and doing things at Halloween and, and celebrating a lot of these traditional Halloween things. But even I could see that on campus, this was an abuse of this Christian freedom that Paul talks about in Romans 14 and 15. I mean, going out and doing stuff that the majority of the people all liked, even though it was encouraging those who thought it was wrong to participate. It was all around. They they couldn't help but be part of it. And this, this wasn't, we, we were exercising our freedom poorly. And, and, and I made sure people knew. Because, hey, I, I was editor of the campus newspaper. So, so that week, I put in an editorial uh, in the campus paper, you know, saying all these things. And, and we got back responses on it. Because you put something out there, you always get responses. And the responses, a lot of the responses are like, but we like this. We're not harming anyone. We have fun doing this. We don't think there's anything wrong with doing this. And I agree. But you know what that is? That's us saying, me first. Christ, through Paul, here is calling us to say, after you. Letting go of our pride, letting go of our rights, as the song Lay Me Down said. We say, after you. You know, in verse 21, Paul writes, It is better not to eat meat or drink anything else that will cause your brother or sister to fall. He says, uh, you know, exercising your freedom in Christ, that's a good thing. It's good that we have freedom in Christ. So it's good to go out and exercise your freedom so you can eat and drink and be merry. But in this situation, Paul says it's better not to. See, something's good. But you've got an opportunity for something better here. It's better to say it's about you. It's better to say after you. You know, it's easy to serve ourselves and to say me first. But saying after you, that's better. You say something's easy, but you can get better. So often we sacrifice what is better for just what's easy. You know, how sad is that? And that's why after you, they're difficult words. When we fail to say after you, we're actually refusing to adopt that heart, that temperament that those words reflect, and we're sacrificing stuff. Jim, show us, please. Jesus himself talking in Matthew chapter 20, verse 26. Whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. Familiar words. Who, who, who knows these words? We know these, right? Here they are. Becoming a servant is, is what Jesus is telling us here. That's what's required 
in order to be able to say the words after you. Jesus knows it, and he lives it. And he knows you can only say after you once you have changed your heart, changed your attitude to one of serving and sacrificing for other people. That's the only way you can say these words. And he goes on. Because he knows that it's absolutely required if you ever want to become great. You see, that's what he says. If you want to become great, you gotta, if you want to become great in that now, as followers of Jesus, we aspire to greatness. Not greatness according to what the world tells us, but greatness according to how God defines greatness. And how does God define greatness? Becoming more and more like our Lord Jesus Christ. That's greatness. And Jesus tells us right here, if you ever want to have any chance of reaching that greatness, hey, if you ever want to come anywhere close to achieving this, this which is your life goal, if you ever want to get anywhere close to become great like Jesus, if you ever want to be anywhere close to the greatness of Jesus, then the words after you must become easy words because they're easy words because they reflect your attitude, they reflect your heart. They become easy words because you have truly given your life over to being a servant of others. How many of us sacrifice greatness, greatness in Christ, just because we refuse to say after you? You Getting back to our text from today, Romans chapter 15, verse 1, Paul writes, We who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak and not please ourselves. You know what he's saying? He's saying... You who are strong believers, you who want to be strong in your faith and your dedication, you who want to reach that greatness in Christ, you need to be saying after you. Stop looking and please yourself. Jim, show us here how he follows it up in verses 2 and 3. Each of us should please our neighbors for their good, to build them up. For even Christ did not please himself. Each of us should be saying to our neighbors, those around us, you first, after you. We should be focused on their good. We should be focused on building them up instead of ourselves. You know, I I remembered this week a scene from one of the original Scooby-Doo episodes. You wonder why we had that, right? Here it is. uh, A scene from one of the original Scooby-Doo episodes. You know, the better ones. uh, Way back in the originals. Um, And I I don't even remember anything else about the episode. But I remember this for years. And I I didn't even remember uh, enough about it to look up more details this week. I I just couldn't find anything. But there's an episode in which Scooby and Shaggy, you know them, our heroes Scooby and Shaggy, they need to go somewhere spooky. I, I, I don't know where. And they're there arguing about who's going to go first. Not because they're being considerate of each other. Because, no, in this case, going first is is the selfless thing. Staying back is the selfish thing. So like, you go first. No, you go first. You go first. And you know how the argument finally ends? Shaggy finally says to Scooby, like Scoob, I'll go first after you. And so Scooby, of course, he's tricked. You know, because it sounds like Shaggy's being generous and he's going to go first. So Scooby goes. And it's like kind of a silly and a funny moment. And I remember after all these years. But I think sometimes that's how we are as followers of Jesus. You know, we like people to think well, we're serving them. We like to look like we're serving them. But really, it's only a guise, right? We're like, we're like shaggy, you know. So often we say after you, only when we've kind of thought about it, we realize ultimately, this serves my own purposes. But our focus should be instead, not on ourselves. We should be seeking to build others up. After all, that's what it means to follow Christ. Uh, Christ did not please himself. It says it right there. Christ said, after you in all things, unto death, he said after you. And we must be willing to do likewise if we are following Christ. And if we cannot do likewise, if we cannot say likewise, we have to consider whether we are really following Christ. You know, it's squirm time, isn't it? The question is, who has God put in your life right now to whom you need to start saying after you? And these people are everywhere. It might be that woman in Walmart who keeps getting in your way. Oh, there's always someone in the way at Walmart, right? Right? You know this. Oh, it might be, might be that guy who's in line in front of you in Subway, and he's taken forever to order his sandwich, and you just want to get going. It might be something that hits a little closer to home. It might be someone in your family, a child, a spouse. A parent, a sibling, might be someone at work, probably someone at work. 
This is someone in, in this room, someone in this congregation. Who do you need to start saying after you to? You know, Money Magazine from October 2012 had an interview in it with Harvard Business School professor Clayton Christensen. And I don't know if Christensen is a follower of Jesus or not. I do not. But his words certainly hit home according to what we're studying here today. In the interview, he said, I believe that the source of our deepest happiness comes from investments we make in intimate relationships with our spouse, children, and close friends. And he goes on to say, the way I ought to measure my life is in terms of the others I helped to become better and happier people. That's the biggest thing to think about if you're not happy. You know, he, he kind of equates being happy with serving others. That, that's, that's a Christian thing. What he's describing here is the life of those people who regularly are saying to the people in their life, after you. The real nature of the question is this. To whom are you being selfish toward and refusing to serve? If that's your attitude and your heart toward them, then you're never going to be able to say these words after you. Those will continue to be difficult words. I dare you to look to and to lay hold of and to live in the greatness of Jesus Christ by seeking to be a servant. Sacrificing your rights, your pride for the good of others. Not pleasing yourself. So you're free to build others up. You do that in the name of Jesus Christ. And I guarantee the words after you, they won't be difficult words. They'll be the first words out of your mouth. They'll be the easiest words for you to say. After you. Let's pray.